something I'm observing that seems to be going on, certainly in some people around me, although I am in certain circles that reflect me, is some kind of re-interest in, in spiritual ideas and more holistic thinking. And from what you've said, I'm wondering if this is perhaps us trying to reconnect with the right hemisphere, with a bigger picture way of being, and perhaps in fact what spiritual religious thought kind of does is situate the self within a much broader context that is all interconnected and immediately resonating with each other. Um, is that kind of, am I along the right lines here, do you think? I, I certainly would think you are. And one of the things that um, gives me hope is that um, uh, there is a, a strong movement, particularly young, amongst young people, towards um, spiritual wisdom literature, if I can put it like that. Um, it's so hard to know what language to use about these things, but um, I, I think we know what we're talking about here, which is indeed the reaction to the sense that we've been told that the world is pointless, purposeless, meaningless, and all the rest. Um, this is due to very bad science. It's due to people who are good at doing what they're paid to do, be a microbiologist or an astronomer, um, getting the idea that that gives them the right to pronounce on whether there's a god or not, uh, which is something they're not in a position to do. <coughs> and, Sorry. Science can't a, a pro approach the question. Uh, it has literally nothing to say about the question of whether there is a god, and it has nothing to say about purpose, because science perfectly correctly um, rules out such questions. It simply is looking at mechanisms. Of course, if you then, after having ruled purpose out of the picture, having inspected the picture solemnly for a long time, pronounced there is no purpose, you're simply describing your own handiwork. You're not describing any external reality. So people intuitively understand that actually the things around them do have purpose. In fact, it's um, an interesting observation that if you talk to um, biologists, uh, off the record, they will say, well, of course, there are purposes in nature. One sees them everywhere. And it's almost impossible to describe anything one sees without language of purpose, which is manifest. If you read the literature, you see it everywhere. But, you know, I can't say that because I lose my job. So it's another example of the um, stultifying orthodoxies that uh, dominate um, academe. But yes, I do think that's right. But I think uh, You'll not be surprised to hear me say that everything has its left hemisphere aspects and its right hemisphere aspects. Because the, the bad old days, we thought, well, this kind of stuff goes on in the left hemisphere and this kind of stuff gets processed in the right hemisphere. But this is not the case. Everything that we do is processed, or in other words, brought into being for us through both hemispheres. It's just that each hemisphere has a reliably different way of doing that, a different take on it. And this is true of spirituality too. If there was to be a kind of religion that was left hemisphere, what would it look like? Well, first of all, people who belong to it would be absolutely certain that um, they were right. Um, they would have no time for anyone who took a different point of view. Um, it would all be written down in a manual somewhere, which was um, not allowed to be disputed. If you looked at this book, you would find that this was how it was, because it says so on this piece of paper. Um, Starting to sound familiar. People, people, people would become unempathic towards their adversaries, and I, I don't think I need to go any further, because you can spot oh, um, where this is going on in our world mm. uh, in more than one religion. So there's that. But I think that the part of religion which says there, is, there are things that we cannot know, not because we're stupid, but because we have the wisdom, the insight to see that there are things that intrinsically are beyond the capacity of the human mind. And it's, it's rather an odd assumption that everything in the universe should be comprehensible to the human mind. Uh, we're, after all, evolving beings. And, one wouldn't have thought it um, 
a good conclusion for a squirrel to come to that it could understand everything in the universe. We're just further up this, or sideways anyway, along this <laughs> um, this 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 process, um, and there's no reason why we should know everything. And I think a bit of humility, a bit of sense that things are complex, that sometimes opposites come together, that things that are numinous, that have a sense of something awe-inspiring in them. Um, what a shame that the word awesome has become so trivialized. Um, but that's another issue. I, I went somewhere to speak and on my way to the lecture, I passed the campus where I just had, uh, on the campus, the coffee bar where I just had a morning coffee, which was actually one of the less good coffees I'd had for a long time. And outside it said, awesome barista coffee. Well, mm, uh, in a world where that is awesome, what is left to describe the, which you've seen, if you've seen the film, The Divided Brain, the amazing landscape in which I live, you know. Mm. Anyway, if people get back in touch with those things, and I think being in touch with nature is a good thing. I think being silent is a good thing. And being in touch with nature and silent would be an even better thing. But switching off the noise, switching off the machines, being at peace with yourself and reconnecting with nature slowly would be a wonderfully healing thing, is undoubtedly a healing thing, as a testimony of everybody who's ever tried it um, will let you know. Mm. So, yes, these things, I'm very pleased that people are moving in those directions. Um, and I think it's worth cultivating, but I think we also need to be on our guard against um, a kind of commercialization of spirituality, if you like, where it means um, eating health foods, um, having nice scented candles, and... Um, Doing a bit of yoga. <laughs> bit of yoga. Nothing against yoga. Of course, there are deep things in yoga. But this is, it has to be more than that. And there is some uh, wisdom, surprisingly, to be found in the conventional religious traditions alongside many things one would like to have done without. Um, we're not asked to be indiscriminatory or undiscriminating in our approach to these things. But if one, there's so much richness in the Sufi tradition of Islam, in the rich mystical, medieval mystical, particularly tradition of Christianity and the early church fathers, um, in uh, Taoism, in Buddhism, especially in Zen Buddhism, um, and in fact in many of the Hindu myths, um, there is such wisdom there that we don't really need to invent a, a, an intelligent uh, religion of our own. Uh, we can find it there if we want, but everyone to their own, and I've nothing against people finding their spiritual path in whatever way they can. Uh, in fact, it's up to each of us to find that path um, in whatever way we can. Hmm. You know, I was thinking about different ways of knowing as you were speaking there, because I think perhaps it's the left way, brain way of knowing. It's very descriptive and everything's got an explanation, but there are very much more participatory forms of knowing and I think one good example of this is is being in love it's like when you say to someone well what does love feel like and how do you know when you're in love well you know it's something that's there it's 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 a state of being it's not a statement I am in love with you although the statement just kind of performs something that's already there and I think it's the same, you know, when you go out into nature and you really confront the wilderness, the forest or the raging ocean and you kind of just like, I, I'm part of this and this is part of me somehow. And I can't explain the tides or explain the dynamics of the forest and the creatures living there, but I can know myself to be with it rather than be explaining it. Yes, the, there are different kinds of knowledge, as you so rightly say, and uh, as I often point out, in most languages there are different verbs for different kinds of knowing. In English, unfortunately, there's only one. But they are very, very different. There's knowing through, through experience of somebody, some place, some, as you say, something like love, which can't be conveyed except by someone else being taken to that experience and participating. 
And there's another kind of non-participatory knowledge, which is the kind that is now um, perhaps the only kind that our education seems inclined to cultivate, which is of certain kinds of factual um, knowledge. Um, and understanding is not the same as knowledge. Uh, to understand a forest, as you say, it is very good to know many technical things about how trees grow and communicate with one another and in fact can enrich your understanding of quite how marvellous and extraordinary and complex um, that forest is. But to, to understand it is to be there and to be aware and open, to think aware of and open to things that cannot be verbalised. Nothing is less true than that you only understand something when it's expressed in language. There's such a thing as explaining things away. There's such a thing as substituting a very poor expression in words for something immensely rich that language has had to trim in order to encompass and indeed to constrict it. So, yes, we're losing sight of that. We're losing sight of the idea that education is not about putting things into people, but by drawing something out in them that is already there. In other words, nourishing things that are there. And I do think this is enormously important because um, you know that people like uh, Dawkins say that um, children would never, for example, have um, ideas about um, the spiritual, about a life in a world beyond what we can see um, if they, and even of the sacred, if they had not been taught these things in school. Well, first of all, no, they're not taught these things in school, and very rarely at home. But secondly, research shows that the process is exactly the opposite, that young children around the age of five naturally use this language, even if it's not a language that has been in any sense inculcated. But by the time they've been to school for two or three years, they learn it's not smart to talk like this, and they stop talking like this. Now, it is absolutely right that if you do not attend to things, you do not know they're there. There are many wonderful and amusing instances of this, some of them by um, Darren Brown, you know, uh, who's an illusionist, but they're well known to mainstream psychology that the most blatant things can be there and you just don't see them because you're not attending to them. Now, and, and in some ways that's what I was saying about the difference between the right and the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere uh, takes in the whole picture, the left hemisphere only takes in a little and what it doesn't attend to, as far as it's concerned, doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just not see it. As far as it's concerned, it's not there. Now, if you're brought up in this way, um, then, of course, all those intimations you had as a child, that there was more to this than meets the eye, you'll think, yeah, but that's, that's not right, because I now know that it's, you know, water is H2O and it works like this and so on. And you lose the sheer immediate amazement of water, this extraordinary stuff that is in itself, you know, one of the most familiar things in the world and one of the most richly rewarding to meditate about. It has a lot, a lot of meaning. So it, these things are lost. And I know that in my own experience, um, my father was a, a roundly atheistic person. So I certainly wasn't, uh, I was never taken to church um, or, or, or any of that was uh, in my diet. But I remember thinking as a fairly young child, probably starting around the age of 10 or so, um, that there was the sense of what I call the numinous, the sense that when exposed to a beautiful natural scene, I was, I was communicating with something and it was communicating with me. And it was only other people saying, but you know that can't be. That, but, I know, but I think it's right, actually. And there were lots of other things, like you know, the, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. I knew this was right. And people said, but when, well, that can't be. I mean, what is this magical something that's been added when you put the parts together? I mean, I now know all kinds of philo philosophical, sophisticated ways of thinking about this, which would validate my childish intuitions. But those intuitions were onto something that I, you know, it's taken me 
a long time. I've never let go of them, thank God. But I have taken a long time to find an intellectual way of understanding why they're important. But, but the fact is that if we don't use these faculties, and if we don't nourish them, we won't know what they're for. In fact, we'll lose them. So that it's no good saying to Richard Dawkins, go, attend to this, see what happens. Um, because he'll say, well, there's nothing there, because by now he won't see it, I'm afraid. So, of course, they, you know, they turn around and say, but you're fantasizing. And all one can say is, look, it's not up to me to change your mind. You're welcome to whatever you believe, but I have a different experience. Mm. And yeah, I think that's something that's like, you know, it's funny that education has such a detrimental effect on people's ability to sort of express these things that they feel like they know. Because especially when you put it how you put it there, it seems like the kind of thing that we would want to cultivate in 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 our society. It seems like an ability that would really help to bring people together and that would, um, you know, help to just enrich sort of the world that everyone's going to end up sort of living in, especially in terms of just how everyone's like the world of their own minds that they're going to end up sort of inhabiting for their entire lives. That if we kind of, you know, you can kind of see how a lot of the craziness that exists nowadays can come about. If you think about, you know, our current system of basically teaching people stuff as being one that takes away your ability to express anything that can't be sort of like known in the sort of like it, it, within the within the strict confines of a sort of um, like, you know, a factual rules based objectivist method of knowing things. You can kind of see why people could then end up like going for some really quite, you know, silly and out there and detrimental ideas, you know, to maybe yeah. to fill the hole left by 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 all the stuff that they 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 feel like they know, but they've been told to think that they don't know. Hmm. Very good. Um, there's a lovely <clears throat> remark by G.K. Chesterton. He says, "When people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything." I think it's good. <clears throat> and. Yes, I think that is right. Um, we could say, I think, that there are many paths to this understanding. Um, and only one, and probably not the most effective, is immersion necessarily in a religion. Although I think it was quite good that when I grew up, as it were, it was another element that formed part of what I call a more cohesive culture was that you were, whether you liked it or not at school, um, exposed to certain things like reading the Bible a bit and, uh, and so forth. And so one got a bit of that. Not that I'm a huge fan of the Bible, actually. Um, parts of it, as they say, are excellent um, and parts of it are not. But, um, but it's through other things. It's through, for me, and I think for a lot of people, one of the most powerful um, routes to this transcendental world is, well, you mentioned one, which is erotic love, actually. Um, but another is music. Um, and another is poetry. Um, these all, for me, have been very important. Uh, and yet, in school, um, well, the first has been reduced to a lot of technical lessons that make it very explicit and <laughs> something like going to the gym. Uh, and the others have been sort of banished from the curriculum because they, they're not STEM subjects and they don't lead to a, employment in IT. Um, this is a terrible way to run a, an education. In fact, it's, it's the antithesis of education. As I say, it's not drawing something out, which is what the word actually means. It's putting stuff in, knowledge in, which you could really feed into a computer, and then hoping that a certificate comes out at the back end, which will be useful to this person. But it's really not um, allowing this person to flourish as a human being. I think this idea of human flourishing is a very important one. It has a moral aspect to it, that the reason 
one wishes to lead a moral life is not so much to avoid punishment or whatever, but because it is in itself a way in which we flourish and other people around us flourish. I think being surrounded by things that are beautiful and being grateful for them, not um, taking them for granted, but seeing through them. Um, I say see through because it's afraid, another favorite uh, expression of mine that we shouldn't stop at the surfaces of things, but we should see what lies deep in them. For example, I can look at the garden in front of my house and I can see trees and plants and, and all the rest, or I can see through it and see something that is a living being that makes my, my heart really you know, glad. And I can look at something very beautiful and be thankful for it every day. These experiences of the, the good, the true, the beautiful help us to flourish. And denying the truth, which so often is what is going on in the world around us, surrounding ourselves with ugliness, debasing morality to obeying rules rather than a goodness that comes from within, where if it's not actually forbidden by law, it's not wrong to do something. That is becoming a common attitude. Well, there's no law against it. I'm only doing my job. And, you know, the law says and yeah, but the law was never supposed to be um, some kind of a, a, a manual in which you looked things up and found out whether they were good or bad. Um, there's a lot more to morality than that. So, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm probably giving you too long an answer to this, but I think that there are different ways. I think there are different ways in which we can flourish as human beings, and they involve this reciprocity of us with the cosmos. Um, and this is not just something sort of new agey. Um, as you've probably gathered, I'm not particularly new agey. Um, um, not even when New Agey was fashionable was I in New Agey. Um, and it's actually very much confirmed by modern physics. I mean, f fortunately, most physicists understand the sort of things I'm saying very well. Um, it's biologists that have difficulty with it. We rather now, oddly, live in a world in which physicists find that the cosmos has plenty of place for purpose, meaning, beauty, order, uh, and even the possibility of a divineness, a divinity, whereas um, the life sciences uh, pundits uh, have found that it's just a bunch of inanimate um, uh, uh, stuff uh, whizzing around pointlessly in, in, in a universe that has um, nothing in it at all of any meaning to a human being. Now, that is a very strange state of affairs. In fact, if I were, what we need is a Swift, a Jonathan Swift of our era. He pilloried the things that were happening at his time that, that seemed so extraordinary. But really, if you said to most people at, at any point in the history of this planet that we lived in a world where we believe many of the things that we now believe, they would, they would simply find it impossible that people could take seriously the things we say to one another every day, solemnly, you know. That, yeah. So I, I, there, I there I feel we, we we're losing we're losing the plot really, as I as I say in the in the film The Divided Brain. We, we we've entered a world in which, um, if there is a future to look back on us, uh, we will be seen as both the the stupidest and the greediest and the most destructive um, human beings that ever lived. Mm. Mm, it's a it's a bit depressing, really, but I feel like it's it's kind of a case of like in order to sort of solve the problem, you have to recognize that there is one to begin with, obviously. And this problem is it's it's an excellently terrible problem to have because it is a problem that is by definition not solvable with all of the massive and increasingly complex and powerful problem solving machinery that we have created because it's actually a problem that exists within all of that social and physical machinery because it's a problem with how we think when we use and when we create that machinery and so i mean for me i feel like there's it's it's going to be a difficult one to sort of rein in um 
that's that aspect of us that's sort of brought us so much sort of pleasantries and also lots of incredibly you know um uh can't find the adjective just medical advancements that save millions of lives every year and the ability to put people on the moon and that's all like you know really cool but you know the, the sort of society species-wide self-reflection um that you know seems necessary is something that i'm just like not I'm, I'm, I'm just not sh like sure that we that we're gonna have to develop equivalently vast and powerful mechanisms but of an entirely different nature to achieve that goal at least f from where i can see it well <clears throat> unfortunately i don't think we do have to um it seems to me such a waste of time to try to create machines to be like people when we're making people more like machines, and it would be much better to make people better people. Um, mm. That is something we can do, and it doesn't require any expense of resource. It doesn't require technology. It doesn't require wars in Africa over minerals that destroy the habitat and the ways of life of the people who eventually live there. It doesn't require people in China to kill themselves because they're, they're being worked to make my iPhone. We don't need this. Uh, of course, nobody will listen to what I'm saying, <laughs> but <laughs> now, but there will come a point. Uh, and often people only act when a catastrophe is so close that they can't ignore it any longer. Because don't forget, the left hemisphere goes, problem? What problem? We can solve that. But you can't solve this problem by going further down the path that created this problem. So what we need to do is something really quite simple, which is to stop relying on machines to solve problems. All the things that we need, we have within us to resolve. Um, we, but we're not using them. We're stunted versions of what a human being could be, and indeed at times in the past may have achieved. So that at some of the periods in history that I could point to, um, where civilizations have really flourished, there was, I think, greater wisdom about the culture than there is now. So we know it can be done. Um, we know that people are not stupid and they're not any worse morally than they ever were before. They just have more power. Technology is about power. Why do you want to give ever more power to people who don't have wisdom. The first thing you need is wisdom. Because if not, then the power will destroy. So we need urgently to rethink how we lead our lives, how we educate children. And I don't mean so that in 40 years time things can be different. We need to be doing this with the greatest of urgency now. And preparing to make life tenable in a future that we can't predict. I can't predict it. Um, I know lots of people do predict doom, and I, I don't predict doom for two reasons. One, because as Niels Bohr, the physicist said, prediction is very difficult, particularly about the future. And because um, we don't really know what the resources of human beings are. There are many points in the past when human beings have seemed to be in a position where a lot of people would have thought, well, it's all up now, and it turned out it wasn't. But it, whatever it is that survives, and something will survive, of course, uh, nature is amazingly multifaceted and will, will come through in the end. Whether there are human beings still to enjoy it, I don't know, but there probably will be some. And I hope there will be, because they will perforce be wiser. They won't be able to rely on the things that we now wastefully rely on. And they will have to live closer to nature. They will have to trust one another and work together in a way that will be very much more fulfilling, although um, it materially um, not as um, extravagant as the way we now lead our lives. But, you know, probably you, like me, have traveled in, in the world and been to places where there is said to be, um, you know, huge um, poverty, and there is in cities. But in 
many of the cultures that are so poor that they don't register because they don't have jobs, they're not in the economy, they are hunter-gatherers. You don't see what you and I would recognize as misery and fulfillment. They have very little, but they are relatively fulfilled. Now, the worst thing that can happen is that people come along and say, we're going to put you in houses, we're going to take you to the big city, we're going to put you in jobs. And those people will suddenly enter the economy. And people like Steven Pinker will say they've been brought out of poverty, but they will have been degraded into the most terrible poverty, which is to be in a third world slum, than which I cannot imagine anything worse. So we have to be different about, <laughs> we have to think differently about what it means to be a human being, after all, which is surely one of the questions we're here to not solve. I hate this idea that life is about solving problems. It's not in that left hemisphere way. If only I can get a machine to answer this question. <laughs> solving the problem means living the life. You know, it's, it's, it's solved in the process of living. All these questions are not questions you write down, you think about and you come up with an answer. They are questions which have the structure of something you address and you respond to in the process of living alongside other human beings and in communion with the natural world. That is where we need to be again and we need to be there really rather quickly. I think that there are people with an enthusiasm to see this come about. That is the great ray of hope. I hope and so. Let, I hope so. And, you know, I think it, that will come from the young. It won't come from old buffers. Um, but old buffers like me still have a place in saying what I can see from simply the matter of having lived a bit. Mm. <laughs> so speaking, if I were to ask you as a psychiatrist, and if if the world was your patient, what would you advise it on a very practical level? What could people do to... Um, <laughs> to bring themselves away from some of these problems we've been discussing today. Nature, I suppose. As well. well, yes, but, but, but I don't want to produce a left hemisphere list of tick boxes, so that as long as I've done these, everything will be all right, because it's not like that. I'm talking about a change of heart and mind, as you, I, I know you know. Um, but what, and of course, that is what therapy does, is it doesn't say um, what I never did with patients, was say, well, occasionally I would say it might be a good idea to try doing this, but usually what you have to do is get people to see for themselves what they need to do, and then they will actually do it. If you tell them before they're ready to see why, they won't. So apparently it's a matter of getting people to a position where they see what it is um, that needs to be done and resonate with perhaps the description of the problems that I'm, I'm trying to eliminate. I think then that... Um, not being in denial is very important. There are two things about denial, and it's a very common feature in humanity generally, not just in people who are relying only on their left hemisphere. But one is that it's much more painful, the thing that you're denying, than once you've accepted it. And secondly, that it gains power from being denied. So for example, um, a very common problem for many patients is to accept that they are not perfect. I mean, you may think that's a very weird thing. Uh, of course, we're not perfect. And you can say that intellectually, but you'd be amazed that when you dig down just slightly under the surface, how many people secretly believe that they must be perfect and that everything about them that is not perfect is a reason for hating themselves and therefore for denying it, trying to claim it doesn't belong in them, painting it onto somebody else, called projection. Um, and it causes misery for them and for people around them. And it becomes dominant in their life. Now, if you can just say, look, of course you're not perfect. And I don't know why. I mean, one of the things I used to say to people is, you know, there's a book called You're All Right, I'm All Right. You know, I used to say, Look, you're not all right. I'm not all right. But that's all right. <laughs> um, that if, if we could accept, you know, 
that we don't have to solve everything. We have to start with the bit we have some control over, which is ourselves. And really ask ourselves the difficult questions. Don't deny the things we don't like. Don't pretend that everything is fine. That, but don't go into a panic and say it's all hopeless. Because it never is hopeless. In fact, if everybody who is of this mind were to start tomorrow to put into their lives some of the things that I'm not going to give a list of do this, do that, and do the other, but people can see for themselves. Right. Then, you know, the world would be already on the road to something else. One thing I've noticed is that there have been, in my lifetime, many movements that looked like they were small movements for a short while, and they actually became very big movements rather quickly. They didn't solve all the world's problems. But there was a time when I thought that regime change would never happen in South Africa or in the Soviet Union. And I was amazed at how fast it did. There was a time when I thought um, environmentalism would be a fringe aspect of the way we think. And it's taken, yes, too long, but it is no longer a fringe aspect of anybody's discourse. So we need to take it very much further, don't get me wrong. But all I'm really saying is that big changes can happen and this is one on which our lives depend on which everything precious to us depends and i'm a grandparent and you know i want to be able to not have fouled up this world to such an extent that there is no viable world for my children and their children mm. and i'd like to say that not just as a parent because i think if i have no children i feel the same way about about human beings society and civilization, all the wonderful things it's done and produced, all the beautiful and great people, the thinkers, the, the, the musicians, the composers, the artists, the, the writers, the poets, the saints, the, you know, and we want to hold on to that. We don't want it all just to be blown up because we wanted more and more comfort. Comfort's not even good for you, you know. A bit of comfort's great, especially to get older, but it's quite good. <laughs> Quite good to be uncomfortable a lot of the time as well, especially intellectually, I might say. So, anyway. wow, certainly some profound, uh, profound advice for, for everyone, really. Well, I don't know if there was any advice there, really, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> I, say that I disappointed you by not giving you advice, but then that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, like um, I recently asked a, uh, a Zen Buddhist master for some advice on uh, on choosing a spiritual path. And he said, don't trust anyone, not even me. And I was like, oh. <laughs> he's just done me. <laughs> he he, he was right. Was this uh, is lovely. Sorry. No, well, I, I was think just what going to Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the computer is messing with us now. I think, I think we have like a half second delay, yeah. so it's just long enough to think that someone has stopped talking. So. No, no, no. I, well, all I was going to say is that um, I, I once had a rather nice thing on the radio by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Um, he was talking about a pious um, man who was reading the Talmud and he prayed to God because he read that Rabbi X had said that it was very important that you should do a certain thing. And then he read later in the Talmud that Rabbi Y had said exactly the opposite. And he, he was very perplexed by this. And um, because, of course, what it says on this piece of paper. <laughs> um, so he prayed and uh, he said, so which one of them is right? And God replied, both of them are right. And in frustration, he said, but, but they can't both be right. To which God replied, all three of you are right. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, there we are. Um, well, look, I, I don't know what you want to do with it all, but um, I'm sure you'll edit it and whatever. But when it's going up, uh, let me know. Cool. Awesome, yeah. Good. Ian, thank you so much for your time. It's, yeah, uh, definitely. It's a real privilege to be able to talk to you. Yeah, it's been super, yeah. super interesting, and I'm sure we've covered a lot of a lot of a lot of stuff that should hopefully be interesting to everyone else in the world besides us three. So, <laughs> <laughs> I hope cool. so. 
Um, is there anything you want to plug at all about the latest book or any speaking that you'll be doing at all? No, I, I not particularly, thanks. Um, I mean, the book is 28, 30th finished now. Um, so I'm hoping to get it. After that, there'll be a long editing process because it's um, it's going to be, unless I do something about it, it's going to be half as long again as The Master and His Emissary. Um, it's already a very long book. So, um, and the speaking, yeah, I'm trying not to do too much speaking uh, until I've got this book out of the way. So, but thank you for the offer. But mm -hmm. I mean, just, you know, pe pe send people to my website, you know, uh, there'll be stuff on that. Yeah. Fantastic. Ian, once again, thank you so much.